So, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for being here today. The title of my work is Geophysical and Landscape Examination of the Confederate Prison in Salisbury, North Carolina. The UNCG Remote Sensing Laboratory was contacted by the North Carolina Office of State Archaeology and the Historic Salisbury Foundation to conduct geophysical investigations. The parcel in question, 313 East Bank Street, is owned by the Historic Salisbury Foundation and is located in the downtown area of Salisbury. The area around East Bank Street was the location of a Confederate prison. Based on historic maps, members of the Historic Salisbury Foundation had reason to believe that this parcel contained the remnants of the main prison barracks. The lot across the street, 320 East Bank Street, was also surveyed in hopes to discover surrounding buildings. The North Carolina Office of State Archaeology and the Historic Salisbury Foundation hoped the geophysical survey could confirm and determine the location of the remains of the cotton mill turned prison barrack on the property. This study incorporates geophysical surveying to aid in the discovery of the original remains of the Confederate prison. The main goals of this project are to study the historic landscape, locate the prison barrack, and to bring all previous works together. Here I have our two areas of interest. The first picture is the two lots, lot 313 East Bank Street and the parcel across the street, lot 320. The second picture is a assumed prison layout provided by the Rowan County GIS. After North Carolina succeeded from the Union in May 1861, in December that same year, a Confederate prison was erected in downtown Salisbury. An abandoned cotton mill three stories high and located adjacent to the main railroad was converted into the prison barracks. There were a few small subsidiary buildings for the officers' quarters and a wooden fence encompassing most of the 16-acre prison. Shortly after the prison's inception, only 120 men occupied it. When the Union stopped the prisoner exchange program in August 1864, inmate population quickly increased. By November 1864, the prison held about 10,000 prisoners and disease quickly spread throughout the overcrowded prison due to a shortage of food and medicine. Bodies were transported by ways of wagon to abandoned cornfields where they were placed in a total of 18 mass graves. The men were then divided into groups based on health. The larger, healthier group was shipped to Greensboro, North Carolina, then on to Wilmington, North Carolina. The smaller, malnourished group were then taken to Richmond, Virginia. After the Confederate Army surrendered on April 9, 1865, three days later, the prison was disassembled and burned. The remaining bricks were used in the construction of some of the buildings in downtown Salisbury. Um, these are some historic images um, done of the prison during its time. Something to keep in mind is the main entrance of the prison, how it looks. It's important for later on in the research. All landscapes have cultural meaning. The landscape shows the past and present effects of from humans' interactions with that landscape. It is inheritably a spatial perspective, and this allows for the understanding of distribution and patterns within a complex community. Here I've created a cultural and historic timeline for my area of interest. These ongoing changes interact with the landscape. Each physical change holds different meanings to the individual according to how that person views the structure within the landscape effects on the employees, the inmates, the surrounding population, and the physical effects on the landscape itself. Whether the individual has a positive or negative association with this place is how a cultural landscape is painted. Ground penetrating radar sends short pulses of high frequency radio waves from an antenna into the ground. The pulses move as uniform waves down through the soil and when the signal has detected a feature or buried object, the signal will propagate back to the antenna. The type of antenna chosen is important in regard to the depth and resolution. The higher the antenna frequency, the shallower the depth, and the higher the resolution. Soil properties, sediment, water content, 
depth of buried features, and vegetation are all important factors that could affect the usefulness of the data. The collaboration between geographers and archaeologists lead to a better understanding about cultural landscapes. The additional benefit of geophysical analysis within the two fields is locating subsurface features with minimal amount of excavation. <coughs> to help understand the historic landscape, previous archaeological and geophysical analysis were reviewed. In the summers of 1983 and 1984, Dr. Jane Sally D.D. Joyce led an archaeology field school in hopes of finding the remnants of the palisade wall that surrounded the prison. At the end of both field sessions, Dr. Joyce and her students had excavated a total of 31 units and discovered a variety of artifacts. The students recovered artifacts including old nails, pieces of pottery, buttons, marbles, and other miscellany. Some of the other cultural remains that were unearthed by the team were post holes, most likely associated with the gate that encompassed the prison. Dr. Joyce mentioned to the Salisbury Post that she would like to return the fall to focus on the location of the old mill. She didn't return, but Dr. Joyce's student field journals, unit layer sheets, and other materials were sent to Wake Forest University and the Archaeological Laboratory, where it has been in the care of Dr. Paul Thacker. Um, these primary documents are on, currently on loan to the author for analysis, interpretation, and scanning purposes for this project. Um, so the first image you see is the news clipping from the Salisbury Post where they did an interview with Dr. Joyce. Uh, the second image is just one of her field students' um, journals of some of the units they drew. And this last piece of paper is a transcent map where Dee Dee has drawn her hand-drawn datum, um, which was very important to our research. Another project I reviewed was Mr. Ken Robinson of Wake Forest University. The project had four main research areas in 2005, which used both geophysical and archaeological survey methods. In 2012, Mr. Robinson returned to the prison site to excavate the area of 320 East Bank Street. According to the historic drawn map, Building 9 was recorded as one of the hospitals. The main source of Mr. Robinson's information was a PowerPoint presented on the first collection day, along with a meeting which resulted in personal communication of areas that were surveyed and excavated. From both Dr. Joyce and Mr. Robinson, no formal report was on file at the North Carolina Office State Archaeology. And this is just a PowerPoint um, slide taken from Mr. Robinson's um, presentation showing his areas that he worked. Some of the methods used for this project uh, were the review of all historic data, sandboard maps, modern aerial photography, GPR with a 400 megahertz antenna, and ARC GIS analysis and tools. One of the most vital pieces of information was the hand-drawn site map. This map showed the excavation unit placement with a marked concrete datum. The hand-drawn map was then geo-referenced into ArcMap 10.4, and an arbitrary point was created as close to the center where Dr. Joyce identified her datum. It is important to note that it's not spatially accurate because the actual coordinates of the datum were not given. So here we see the other image um, from the previous slides where Dr. Joyce has drawn her concrete datum, and I've just overlaid it over modern aerial photography and created a point. Another valuable piece of information I used was Dr. Joyce's 1984 transit measurements. This form listed all the northeast and southwest cor unit corners in degrees and distance as measured from the datum. To create these points in ArcMap, the direction distance tool was used. The direction distance allows the analyst to create a point with the known distance and direction from an existing point. The field notes listed in degrees, minutes, and distance were modified to decimal degrees as required by the direction distance tool. As you can see from the image created, most of Dr. Joyce's units were some one by twos with some two by twos. 
Some exceptions are Unit 23 and 31, where I'm guessing maybe we're just a clerical error. Um, unit 23 seems a bit large, and um, Unit 31 all the way on the left-hand corner is either very small or non-existent. When mapping Mr. Robinson's survey areas, the only information that was provided was photographs from the field days along with some GPR results. No exact coordinates were provided, and even the PowerPoint presentation that highlighted um, areas of work were just for visual purposes. Field surveys were conducted on two different days. A total of three grids were collected on lot 313 and one on lot 320. Grids 1 and 2 were collected on September 30th, 2016, and grid 4 and 5 were collected on November 12th, 2016. The purpose of the two collection dates were due to a few reasons. One, on the first collection day, it had just previously rained, and the amount of moisture in the soil caused the GPR signal to produce a high amplitude reflection, which could have exaggerated subsurface features. The second collection day hoped to provide drier conditions to produce clearer and more precise data. The second reason for another collection day was to create a larger grid with grid four and survey across the street at the 320 location. Finally, the second collection day also served as a community engagement with the public. When grid one data was produced, or I'm sorry, was processed, there was some high amplitude reflections at the back of the grid. The first image shows Dr. Joyce's hand-drawn map with grid one's GPR data. This high return could be because Dr. Joyce's 1983 excavation units just was the backfill. Another possibility for these high returns could be from the previous structure that was on the property. This structure was burned down and the remaining rubble was pushed away to make way for new construction. The second image displays Dr. Joyce's units and with the process GPR data. It's interesting to note that the GPR data did not pick up any of the backfill from Dr. Joyce's 1984 units. This could be also because the lot has undergone heavy construction causing the soil to be extremely compacted. When mapping Mr. Ken Robinson's survey and excavation areas, the goal was to create worked areas as closely as possible with the information that was given. The parcel boundaries, we have a couple of problems. They don't exactly match up. This could be because Mr. Robinson used an older county file versus the 2014 data that was used for this analysis. The boundaries could have changed, but you can certainly notice the difference when looking at parcel 512 Bank Street. To, and like I said, to complete as full as work as possible, the GPR data that was provided by Mr. Robinson was put from the PowerPoint, was georeferenced into ArcMap. Um, and the area that I'm talking about is right down here. Um, you can see from his PowerPoint presentation, it encompasses the area worked, but the parcel boundary doesn't quite match up. Our main focus area was grid two and grid four, which both indicated high amplitude reflections on the back of the grids. On a planner map, the dimension of the feature are approximately 11 meters long and six meters in width at its widest point. And these are the, from grid four and grid two, our GPR results, and you can see the high amplitude reflection at the back end of the grids. As you can see from grid four, a feature consistent with a rubble pile, which can be seen in the vertical profile beginning about less than 0.25 meters beneath the surface. The profile view of Transect 11 collected from grid four displays an assortment of high amplitude reflections, followed by a void of homogeneous soil, followed by more high amplitude reflections, which are consistent with the outline of the north end of the cotton mill as depicted from historical evidence. And you can see, like I said, in the back end, it almost matches, or it looks very similar to the entrance of the prison. 
The assumed location of the prison barracks created by the Rowan GIS in comparison to the geophysical survey results suggests that the prison is slightly southeast of the original location. The first image displays the Rowan County GIS placement of the prison along with the UNCG Remote Sensing Laboratory geophysical survey results. The second image displays the new placement of the entire prison achieved by employing the same direction distance tool as mentioned in the methods. And from the image, you can just see that we've just shifted the entire prison based on our GPR data results. So from the first image, you can see that it's the Rowan County GIS placement of the Confederate prison site with all the previous and current work. The second image is the prison shifted based on our geophysical survey with all the previous and current work. So here you can see from the first image that it's the GSI provided by the Rowan County. And the second image is our shift which if Dr. Joyce was excavating her units based on the Rowan GSI county data, she should have possibly found the subsurface feature, but based on the GPR results, you can see her units don't quite intercept um, the feature. With the collaboration of the Rowan GSI historians and now the geophysical survey, a geographic footprint allows for more accurate interpretations on how the landscape looked during the Civil War era. The new information provides a fresh perspective on the general area with the possibility of the prison shift. This project was also important for the community outreach which engaged a wide range of academic, academic fields. For future research goals, it would be interesting to compare the archaeological findings to our geophysical data. Um, just a few people that I would definitely like to thank. The Historic Salisbury Foundation, the University, University of Wake Forest, um, the Rowan County GSI, GIS, and of course, University of North Carolina at Greensboro. Thank you all for your time. Yes. So there was a private company that was hired to perform the archaeological investigations. Um, I've seen some preliminary photos. They've definitely got some stuff. It'll be interesting to see the full report um, if I can get my hands on the cop my copy of that. So they did dig. So yes. So something that the Historic Salisbury Foundation was really stressing was they didn't want to excavate too many areas because they knew that there was people buried somewhere within the land, so they didn't want to disturb any possible bodies that were there, just out of respect. So they're very careful about where they wanted to do some units and excavate, um, but I think one of their main, out of all the areas, the cotton mill was just their main focus, but other areas along the prison, um, they didn't want to disturb. Oh, Phoebe. Did you um, have any difficulty going, um, I guess, the GPR, the art, the art product, um, and uh, compatibility, or? Um, no, so the software that we used to process the GPR data was called Radian, and we processed the data, and we got a 3D grid, we plopped it right into ARC, and we didn't have too much trouble. I didn't remember any, but I just... It was a while ago, and now I'm, I'm looking at Aria like, did we have some problems? I don't, I don't know. I don't remember any big problems. Okay. 
day from excavation, and that's where all the uh, what you saw on the Piedmont soil to the heavy red clay. It was all urbanized clay that they were working with. Um, we did some soil samples and we did the, the soil grids. Um, now, as far as when they got in there doing their excavation, I'm not, you know, I can't say. But the soil that was there was clay, urbanized, Cecil. I believe so. I think they're using our GPR data as kind of a definite footprint to as far as how far down they're going to, um, you know, layer by layer. But uh, I'm not exactly sure um, how far down they're going to go. I guess if you find something, you keep going. So thank you.